started. Um, so first of all, welcome everybody and thanks so much for joining us. My name is Andrew Berman. I'm the Executive Director of Village Preservation. We're hosting tonight's virtual City Council District 2 candidate forum with our partners, the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors, East Village Community Coalition, Friends of the Lower East Side, Historic Districts Council, <clears throat> excuse me, and the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative. We're all community-based nonprofits which depend upon the public for support. So if you like what we do, please join, make a donation, or find out more. All of our websites are gonna be dropped in the chat so that you can learn more about us if you need to. And Ariel, I'll ask you to do that now if you can. Um, Village Preservation holds about 80 public programs like this each year, mostly free and open to the public. So certainly find out more. And tomorrow night, these same groups are gonna be hosting a forum for the City Council District 1 candidates. Uh, so if you haven't signed up for that already and are interested, please do um, join us tomorrow night. You can RSVP and reserve a spot on our website. So quickly, a little bit about the format for tonight's forum. Each candidate will get to make two minute opening and closing statements. The moderators, myself and Richard Moses from the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, will ask a series of questions which each candidate will get up to two minutes to reply to. We'll then ask questions that we receive in the chat from attendees, so you can submit a question anytime between now and then. So you can even start submitting them now, but uh, uh, I would recommend listening to the uh, conversation a little bit before submitting your questions to the chat. Um, we'll open all questions to uh, both candidates, but uh, questions from the public, you can indicate whether or not you want to uh, respond or not. Um, we will be strictly uh, keeping track of time, so no responses will go over two minutes. Um, and you'll see that there'll be a timer indicating the uh, amount of time left. A recording of tonight's event will be made available to the public uh, via Village Preservation's website and our YouTube page. And Village Preservation has also asked all candidates to fill out a detailed candidate questionnaire. And those will also made, will be made available to the public uh, through our website. So now I'm going to turn it over to Richard for introductions to the two candidates who are joining us this evening. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, I'm glad you can all be with us today. Uh, we are also very happy to have with us our two candidates, Aaron Hussein and Ali Ryan uh, from New York City Council District 2, which includes roughly the East Village, parts of the Lower East Side below Houston Street, Greenwich Village, NoHo, and the Bowery, and then north to uh, East 35th Street. All District 2 candidates who are receiving public funds were invited to tonight's uh, event. The third candidate for this district, the incumbent uh, Carlina Rivera, was not able to attend uh, due to her scheduling conflicts. On June 22nd, Aaron Hussein will be facing Carlina Rivera in the Democratic primary. The winner of that primary will then face Ali Ryan in the November general election. Ali is not running in the Democratic primary on the 22nd. Uh, Aaron, please begin with a two minute maximum opening statement as, as Andrew had mentioned earlier, uh, which uh, will be followed by a two minute uh, maximum opening statement from Ali. And uh, thank you. To start whenever, okay. Yes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It is so wonderful to see so many very familiar faces um, here, um, including Allie's. Um, I think one thing you're going to hear um, tonight is that the one thing Allie and I differ on is that I'm running in June and she's running in November. Um, otherwise, you're going to hear you're going to hear a lot of similarities. And that's and it's it's so great to be on the screen with somebody who's so like minded. Um, I also want to say thank you very much to the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors, the East Village Community Coalition, Friends of the Lower East Side. Historic Districts Council, the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, and then Village Preservation for hosting us uh, tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to all of you. Um, my name is Erin Hussein, and I am challenging Council Member Carlina Rivera in the Democratic primary on June 22nd. I came to New York in 1988 for college and then law school at Columbia. I am the daughter of a teacher obsessed with history and a general in the US Army and the granddaughter of small business owners. I am a lawyer, a mother, 
an active member of my community and for the past two decades have been the president of one of the largest residential co-ops in the district, directly in the area the de Blasio administration uh, wants to turn into Silicon Alley. I am running because too many of us feel as though we have not been represented for the past three and a half years. I listened to the same campaign promises made by Council Member Rivera four years ago when she wanted our votes and felt the same anger when she was, when she less than a year later abandoned those promises. I looked out for someone to challenge her to give us all a choice and when no one else came forward, I raised my hand. I knew that I would never be able to live with myself if Soho and NoHo were turned into Dubai and intro 2186 crowned a new Robert Moses and I could have done something to stop it, but didn't. So that is why I am sitting here before you on Zoom um, and I look forward to, uh, to this conversation. Now, Allie. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Allie Ryan and I'm running as an independent and I just recently had to create my own party um, to, to run as an independent. It's called the Neighborhood Party. And so I'll be in the November election, as mentioned. I would like to thank Bowery Alliance. Tricks Council, the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative and Village Preservation for inviting me here tonight. And yes, I'm very excited to talk with Aaron about these issues. And I agree, we're, we agree on a lot of these issues. So it's nice to talk to someone who has common sense too. And it's also fun to see lots of familiar faces in the audience tonight as well. And I also would like to add that I, this is, I am personally really excited to be here for this event because I am a daughter of a small business owner and artist. And I also am a small business art, a small business owner. And at, and at one time I was an active artist. Um, now <laughs> my interests have, are, have um, taken me into being a mother of small children and a activist and to save at risk green spaces and public space, as well as an education advocate. And I, like Aaron, felt the need to step forward and run because I felt like we needed a choice because I felt like the de Blasio administration made me, made me become politically active um, year, several years ago. And Council Member Rivera's polit, um, legislation she has co-sponsored or sponsored has affected my has had impact on my family. So Ellie, I'm gonna, we've, we've hit the two minutes, so I'm going to um, stop you there and, and move into the first question for the evening. Um, and we're going to go back and forth between who uh, who answers first and who answers second. So I'll be starting with Ali. So the first question for the evening is village preservation, the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, East Village Community Coalition and the Historic District Council are seeking to expand landmark protections in the East Village. So far, the city's Landmarks Preservation Commission has not moved on any such, such expansions. Would you support significant expansions of landmark protections in the East Village? If so, do you have a sense of where you would like to see landmarked in the neighborhood? And what would you as a city council member do to help bring it about? Allie? Okay, thank you, Andrew. So I would definitely support landmark expansion. I think the, the five historic tenement houses on East 11th Street, um, which was replaced with the Moxie Hotel, is a reason why to st stand up and advocate for landmark buildings in this district. I don't personally have a particular land um, building in mind to landmark, but I would, so I would probably depend on your guidance, um, but I easily could obviously walk around the neighborhood and say, is this one landmark? Can we landmark this one? And, but I think as, as an, as a candidate and as an activist, I can easily write letters and encourage other people to write letters and hold press conferences as a city council member. 
it's, it's also a matter of doing that as well. But I also believe that we have to, it's also a matter of working together with the Landmark Preservation Commission and ex explaining to them that why in the urgency of landmarking these buildings or the particular buildings in case um, and expanding the his um, landmark status of East Village. I would also like to add that I think it's important to put um, to share to talk about buildings from an art historical standpoint or like art an architectural history standpoint. And I don't think we're all I think people may not always be aware of that. So I think the walking tours that Village Preservation and the other preservation groups provide is, is very important. Thank you. Erin, uh, same question. Um, I'm sorry, can, can you just repeat it really quickly? Sorry sure. about that. Um, the Village Preservation, LESPI, East Village Community Coalition and Historic District Council are seeking to expand landmark protections in the East Village. So far, the city's Landmarks Preservation Commission has not moved on any such expansions. Would you support significant expansions of landmark protections in the East Village? If so, is there any place in particular that you would point out? And what would you as a city council member do to help bring this about? Okay, so, uh, sorry about that. Um, so yes, I am very much in favor of expanding landmark protections um, and not, not, only, not only the Lower East Side part of District 2, but also um, there are some areas north in the north part of District 2 and then more central village areas where I think um, you know, I think, I think that there are many, many sites and neighborhoods um, in this district that are ripe and really calling out for preservation um, for, in one, for one reason or another. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna jump right into one of my favorite, uh, favorite topics to talk about right now, but one that I would prefer not to have to talk about right now, which is East River Park. So there are three historic structures that are in East River Park um, that are very much in danger of being destroyed uh, by the uh, disastrous de Blasio Rivera plan to destroy East River Park. Um, there is uh, the Fireboat House, which is the home of the Lower East Side Ecology Center. And then there are two comfort stations, um, one of them right near the tennis courts, which is one of my personal favorites. It's absolutely gorgeous um, example of art deco architecture. Um, and, you know, to, to lose the park and to lose those structures is, um, you know, it's just a, a really, uh, it's, it's something that's so completely avoidable um, by looking at the alternate plans, um, seeing what the alternate plans um, could do to preserve those, um, those, those buildings, um, and, and moving forward with, with a plan for East River Park that makes sense, preserves those buildings and preserves the park. Um, there are other areas of the Lower East Side that I know have been identified um, by Lesby and by Village Preservation. Um, I would definitely be guided by your advice. You all are the experts. Um, I would be doing, you know, all the things, writing letters. I would be having press conferences, holding rallies in front of individual sites, um, you know, testifying myself. Um, I, I feel very, very strongly that, that I need to be on the Aaron, uh, land use committee. Sorry about that. That's okay. We've, we've hit the two minutes. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Richard for the next question. Okay. And, and Aaron, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, what do you think of the job that LPC has done uh, in general and especially in District 2? If you're unsatisfied, what would you do as council member to try to change it? Um, I, think, I think that the LPC has imp imp the LPC a decade ago, I think was a far stronger protector of history, both um, architectural and cultural history. Um, I do think that um, that that in recent history um, there have been there was at least one chair who was um, seemed a little more friendly to developer interests um, and um, I think that the new chair is um, is much more committed to preservation to historic preservation. Um, however, I I feel as though the damage has been done. Um, and I feel like now, instead of, um, I, I feel like when, when landmarking and historic preservation first started in the city, um, everyone or, or, or the vast majority of New Yorkers really stood behind it and understood why it needed to happen. 
And I feel that that has been chipped away um, by subsequent administrations to the point where now we're having to re-explain to people why it is so important. Mm -hmm. And I think that the LPC should also be an ambassador for preservation. Um, you know, they shouldn't be somebody that we're always trying to go to to get them to understand what their job is. Um, I think that they should be uh, far more proactive. Um, and I think that they should be, um, uh, you know, less reactive. I, it's, it's, not in the, it's not a district two, but it's so close to district two that I have to mention 1416 Fifth Avenue, uh, which is right across the street from district two, um, that I found to be a, just a huge disappointment um, that those are buildings that had um, actual, you know, affordable housing in them at one time. Uh, we lost the housing and now we're gain, gaining a massive uh, mid-block um, tower that, that is, I think, completely out of scale and inappropriate for the neighborhood. Um, so it's sort of a double whammy of losing the history, destroying the skyline, and also losing the housing. Oh, thank you, Erin. Uh, Allie? Okay, can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, what do you think of the job the LPC has done in general and especially in District 2? If you're unsatisfied, what would you do as council member to try to change it? So I can't speak for other districts, but I think in council district two, the Lam Lam um, LPC has been failing our district that they haven't come to the aid of historic buildings to be landmark and hasn't has enabled them to be demolished. Um, and for example, the St. Anne's Church facade on East 12th Street, that, that you can see the facade, but behind it is a NYU dormitory. I think that was like supposed to be an example of trying to make things work, but still at the same time, we, need, we should have saved the church. And I think as a city council member, it, it will be interesting to see what happens with an incoming mayor, how the next group of um, commissioners will approach um, preservation. I do agree with Aaron that it is now we're in a, because we have been probably in the like the past 15 years in a, a like a huge movement of development that now we have to re-educate people of why we want to save historic buildings because we've now been divided into NIMBYs and YIMBYs. Yimby, so I think it's really important to reinforce like, like it's about redact, reactive, like retrofitting buildings to meet our needs today. It's actually a, a the carbon footprint that you create is actually smaller if you reuse a building versus building a new building. And I think those are issues that we need to that we need to reinforce as council member to the LPC. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, so the next question, we're going to move from landmarking to zoning. And the question is, uh, and I'm going to start with Ali, uh, followed by, and then it'll be Aaron. What if any sort of changes to zoning in District 2 would you like to see? And what would your general criteria be for supporting or opposing zoning changes in your district? Allie? OK, so for zoning, right now the push is about affordable housing. And I think we also have to think about infrastructure needs as well. And I think in District 2, for the most part, I think infrastructure needs such as schools are being met, um, transportation is being met. But what I don't think is being met is retail. And I, and because we have, or at least I've noticed in East Village in particular, there is a high number of empty storefronts. And whereas, so I think that's something that needs to be addressed. So I think with zoning in particular, we can't, like we need to reinforce that we need to 
make things livable and that not bring in big uh, like chain stores because the chain stores compete with the small businesses to the point like my local favorite shoe store from children's shoe store went out of business because they couldn't compete with Amazon. And so I think that's, it's, that's really important. I know that, but I also think it's important to preserve the density of our area as opposed to increase the density of our area as well. Great, thank you. So Aaron, same question. And you have to unmute. Um, so I am a huge fan of the Chinatown Working Group Plan, um, which I know most of that is in Council District 1, but there is a piece of it that is in district that is in Council District 2. And I think as we've seen, I mean, these council districts are really just lines on maps. Something that happens 10 blocks from Council District 2 is going to deeply affect what happens at Council District 1 and vice versa. Um, I think I, I, I really like the zoning protections I, and that, that have been, um, that have been um, uh, drafted by the Chinatown Working Group. I think they make a lot of sense. Um, they would um, limit the height of buildings. Um, they would limit speculation. It would guarantee some deeply affordable housing, protection for small businesses, um, resistance to uh, big, block chain, big box chain stores. Um, and um, I think that that is something that I would very much support. I am already very much in support of Chinatown Working Group. Um, but closer to home, um, you know, we we really need these. We we really need that the change in zoning of these uh, these avenues that really just cut through um, really the entire district um, from top to bottom. Um, I mean, not not so much University Place, but Broadway, um, Fourth Avenue, Third Avenue, um, Fifth Avenue. Um, we need the zoning protections that Councilmember Rivera promised us that she was going to get. And we need them three and a half years ago when she promised us she was going to get them because we've already lost historic sites. We, we lost the San Denis building, um, which was an absolutely gorgeous building full of small businesses in the form of, of individual therapists um, who now are scrambling to find space. Um, so, so yeah, those are, those are examples of the, of, two types of zoning or, that I would definitely be pushing for uh, immediately right away. Thank you. Richard? Yes, uh, we'll start with you on this, Aaron. Um, how do you differ or agree with the current city council member, Carlina Rivera, when it comes to development and preservation issues? Um, well, I think I, think I for one, um, I, I understand and I believe that changing zoning from zoning that we currently have um, in these, these large corridors, right now the zoning um, incentivizes a developer to make money off of the space by building commercial, including hotels. Um, and, and, and I believe that changing the zoning for these to a zoning that would incentivize the building of residential units um, would actually increase it, it would preserve housing and it would create and it would increase the amount of housing. Um, one of her stated goals has been to preserve and increase affordable housing. And I think that not, not um, obtaining uh, you know, the rezoning, not, not so much downzoning, but not, not obtaining the rezoning of these very large avenues um, that stretch the district, I think it's just, um, it just shows that, uh, sort of a lack of real commitment to affordable housing. Um, I also very much disagree with her on intro 2186. Um, it's something that, you know, when, when you look at our, when you look at the district and you look at, um, you know, the East, East Village down zoning in 2008, um, you know, that was very hard fought and very thoughtful. And it was, I think, you know, sort of the gold standard for community engagement and, and what the city can do when the city is willing to work with the community. Um, you know, something like that would be in danger from intro 2186. Um, and I, I very much, I understand that she's a prime supporter of intro 2186. She was certainly at the press conference in December um, when it was announced, um, when we were all at a rally on city hall steps, uh, you know, fighting displacement. Um, so I, I just, I, I very much disagree with, um, with uh, that, that sort of top-down community planning, because I think it's just, 
it just gives the developer one person um, to, to negotiate with instead of having to deal with the entire community. Well, thank you. Um, Allie? Okay, so for what I'm, I'm aware of, um, Councilmember Rivera's stance on preservation issues, it seems like I, I, like I will definitely say I do not I oppose the council um Corey Johnson's comprehensive planning bill and that Carlina was a co-sponsor of and I um and then also knowing how she hasn't pushed for the um making the area south of Union Square a historic district and so to me, and it seems like, like she's very quiet on the Soho NoHo rezoning plan. Um, she just voted yes for the Governor's Island rezoning plan, which puts almost four million square foot of development on the southern end of the island and makes makes way for office, hotel, retail, and research. So from my perspective, I think she's probably more pro-development. And I think we're in a place that we need to reevaluate where we are. Like I'm actually, I support um, other candidates have come forward to say they want to put a moratorium on the ULIP process, which is our government review process. And I've I, I agree with it because I do think it's broken. It doesn't take into account community input in an honest way. And I think that we need that, you know, before COVID, we didn't have uh, businesses were going out, were going out of business, people were moving out of the city. So we need to address those issues as opposed to continuing to build. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, you've actually somewhat anticipated my next question, but I'm going to give you each uh, two minutes to dive into it or as much time as you, you want uh, within that two minutes. And that is, what is your position on the proposed SOHO NOHO rezoning, which includes parts of District 2? And we're going to ask you to be specific about what you support or oppose about it and why. Um, and I will start with Ali and then move to Erin. Okay. Um, so I I do oppose the Soho NoHo rezoning plan. I think it was um, dishonest, frankly, of the DCP to on May third say, "Oh, we're not we're not certifying the ULIP application for the Soho NoHo rezoning yeah. plan," and um, to prevent. A lawsuit to stop it, and then they come back two weeks later and say, "Oh, we're going to we're going to certify it now." That plan only focuses on affordable housing, but the Envision Soho NoHo plan that was published in 2019 revealed that there that that area is very complex, and just focusing on housing is not going to address all of the issues such as there's not a like you're if you want to increase right now I think there's over 7,000 people living in that area and they want to increase the density and increase um, add like 3,500 people living in that area there's not a school in that in that in that in those neighborhoods so where will the children go to school so to me I do support the Soho NoHo community plan that seems like that's more holistic. And, but again, as I mentioned before, like I do think we need to, we need to put us, um, we need to put a moratorium on the EULA process for right now. And we need to address until we can have in-person hearings. I don't, I'm, I'm very much, a, I'm personally aware that Civic engagement is not being fully met with with Zoom hearings. Thank you. Um, same question, Erin. Um, so I, I agree with a, a lot of what Ali said. Um, you know, it's I have a smaller uh, size. 
Uh, the fresh stuff on. I think someone needs to mute. Um, so anyway, so I, I agree with a lot of what Ellie said. Um, you know, the what the Soho NoHo rezoning is, it's just giving us this like really ridiculous choice that you need to choose between historic preservation um, and and affordable housing, which is just it's just a lie. And one of the so so I will say that there are a couple of things I actually like about it. N nothing about the actual plan, but I do like that this is actually given an opportunity to um, to very publicly expose the lie behind this false choice that uh, the de Blasio administration is trying to push on us. Um, this is it's just an example of a very very divisive, um, you know trying to pit people against each other. And then the, then the only people that are actually gonna win are the developers or the real estate speculators that don't even live in this country, you know, who are just buying these apartments as, um, as investments. Um, you know, I, I, I like the fact that it has um, focused a light on the fact that, um, that the community plan is so well thought out um, and that it that it should be um, taken a look at again. Um, but I really like the fact that it's given an opportunity to um, to groups to really unite, um, like the rally that we had that, or that you had, I'm sorry, you had, I was just a guest um, at Center Street, you know, where you have, you know, you've Chinatown Working Group and Village Preservation and you've got Tenants Pack and you've got Alicia Boyd and we're all standing together and we're saying, you can't divide us. We all want the same thing. We all want affordable housing. We all want deeply, truly, permanently affordable housing. We all want diversity in our neighborhoods, but we also want light. We also want history. And we also want the tourists to come back and start spending money in our small businesses. None of that's gonna happen if it's all glass towers. Thanks very much. Richard? Uh, you just need to unmute, Richard. Yeah, you can probably hear me better with uh, the mute. Um, the current District 2 City Council members campaign promised to only vote to approve the mayor's 14th Street Tech Hub upzoning plan if it included comprehensive protections for the adjacent Greenwich Village and East Village neighborhoods directly to the south. This promise was not kept and the plan was approved without these protections. What do you think of this? What, if anything, would you have done differently to change the outcome? So, Erin, we'll start with you. Um, yeah. So, I so I was one of the I was one of the candidates that four years ago made those promises. Um, I would have um, I would not have abandoned those promises. Um, that was that was an excellent opportunity, an excellent opportunity to get the De Blasio administration to to do some quid pro quo, quid pro quo, um, which they seem to be very good at doing quid pro quo. Um, but unfortunately, um, we, we all made those promises and the person who was elected um, either didn't intend to keep them or she changed her mind. Um, I, you know, we'll, never, we'll never know which. Um, I agree that, I, I think I answered this a little earlier, um, we needed those, those zoning protections then. Um, we still desperately need them. Um, there are sites on Broadway um, uh, I think 1814 14 Broadway, the 816 Broadway, um, the permits were filed to, to demolish that. Um, we lost the Saint Denis. Um, it's been replaced by a large glass tower that's you know completely out of scale and inappropriate for the neighborhood. Um, but really, that's just the beginning. That's the beginning of what's going to happen um, to these to these avenues um, if we don't get the zoning protection. Um, I would have never voted for that never voted for it. I would not have pretended not to vote for it and then voted for it. I would have not voted for it. I would have negotiated. Um, that was the opportunity for District 2 to have a seat at the table with something that the de Blasio administration wanted very badly. Um, and I think that the de Blasio administration, um, you know, would have given those zoning protections if the council person um, had, had been strong enough. Um, I also certainly would have taken a look at all of the documentation to uh, before I voted in any direction, um, just to see you know what a land grab it was, what a giveaway it was to, to this developer. Okay, thanks, Erin. Uh, uh, Ali. So I, I agree with a lot of what Erin said. Um, we will never know what 
influence council member Rivera's um, switcheroo from her, um, from being a candidate making promises to being a council member and negotiating a, a very different deal that has had that has affected our community as well as the as well as the buildings. Um, I personally I I do agree that that was a perfect opportunity to hold the de Blasio administration accountable and to create a, a deal that would be appropriate for our district and for that area. Um, I still think it's possible that to pursue the rezone, like to pursue the zoning protections for that area. Um, and it's a matter of just putting it on the table. Because one thing I have learned in the past two years or past three years of attending ULIP on public hearings is that it's really about the, at the end of the day, it's about the city council member and how they will negotiate, how well they negotiate and they and stand up for their community or whatever the need whatever their constituents want, in my opinion. And I think that's like, you have to keep that true north and whatever you, whatever you do as a city council member. Thanks, uh, Ali. Thanks very much. So uh, once again, you've anticipated our next question, but we'll give you uh, a, a little more time to uh, dive into it. So uh, for both of you, starting with Ali, especially since the Tech Hub approval, the area south of Union Square roughly 3rd to 5th Avenues, 9th to 14th Streets, has been under tremendous development pressure with historic buildings being destroyed and woefully out of scale and out of character hotels, condos, and office buildings going up. The city has refused to support either zoning changes or landmark proposals put forward by Village Preservation and others for the area. The current city council member has also declined to support such proposals. Would you, and what would you do to get the city to enact them? So we both want to know whether or not you would support such protections, but what would you as a council member do to make them, uh, to help make them happen? So Ali, first you. Okay, so yes, I the promises that were made by the candidates in 2017 for to create the protections for the buildings and the tenants in this um, area south of, Union Square, and I would even add Union Square, um, I would honor those and and fight for them. I think it, it, you know, behind the scenes, it's a matter of talking to me, like even before November, it's a matter of talking to mayoral candidates and because they're going to be, whoever wins the mayoral race is going to be bringing in a whole new group of commissioners for the land the preservation for the preservation commission so i think it's a matter of talking to them in advance and saying that this is we need this right this is urgent and within the first 100 days put um put forth letters of recommendation make constituents aware that the public hearings are taking place i know that is something that's I feel like half my job as a candidate right now is just making people aware of what's going on in our district. And so I would continue doing that if elected to city council. And because I, it's not just me by myself, it's not Erin just by herself. We're one of many. And I firmly believe that, that together we will, we will push these, um, does um, landmark designations through. Thank you. So Aaron, uh, same question, both would you support those measures? And if so, what would you as a council member do to help make them a reality? You have to unmute Aaron. I'll get better at this eventually, um, or, or we'll stop using Zoom eventually. Um, Yes, I, I definitely uh, I would support those numbers, uh, those measures, and I would work to get them passed. Um, I think that I think that the reality is, um, 
I think that the new mayor will need to understand that this district can act as a voting block. Um, and I think that that one of those things is communication. Allie's completely right. Um, uh, we, people in the district um, are not kept abreast of things that are going on. Um, I think that uh, the councilmanic office should have a very user-friendly, um, very extensive website that has, you know, every land use decision that's coming up so that people aren't relying on getting an email in their inbox or already very full inbox from their, you know, their favorite preservation group so that they can actually go and, and there's, there's a, a, a dashboard that you can go to and check on a regular basis and see the land use things that are about to be happening. Um, and then when people, um, you know, people get in the habit of, of seeing what's going on and, and submitting testimony and showing up to hearings once there's hearings in person again. Um, but, but it also has to start with the city council person at the very beginning of the term going and meeting with the mayor proactively and saying, the new mayor proactively and saying, there's gonna be things that you want from my district. There's gonna be things that you want from me. Here's a thing that my district wants from you. Here's a thing that I want from you. I want these protections for this area. And these are the reasons because it preserves affordable housing, because it can create affordable housing, because it can save things like supermarkets, which this neighborhood, you know, every neighborhood needs, but this neighborhood seems to be losing one every week. Um, and just saying, you know, this is important to me. And, and, and this is something that we are going to discuss at some point. And if it's not now, I'm gonna keep showing up and showing up until you talk to me about it. Thanks, Aaron. Richard? Uh this is uh, to start with Aaron. Um, what would you do to help small businesses? Would you support this uh, proposed special district in the East Village, which would limit chain stores? Uh, would you, would um, what other measures uh, would you support this Small Business Survival Act? What other measures would you support, and how would you, as city council member, work to get them enacted? Um, yes, on Small Business Job Survival Act. Yes, I said four years ago, and I will say it again now. I think we need it. Um, I, I, there, um, all the concerns that are all the, that are, that are raised as objections to it, I think are completely made up. It's not unconstitutional. It's not illegal. It's not commercial rent control. It just gives a, a good small business who has been a good tenant an opportunity to get a lease extension and, you know, and, and a small business cannot operate on a month to month. And that's what happens to too many, so many of our small businesses is, you know, they'll go into a space, you know, they'll do a great job helping build the community for 10 years. And then the landlord says, oh, wow, this is a really great space. I think I can double this rent. And so when the lease comes up, maybe they don't have, uh, you know, a, a new tenant to come right in. So they'll say, all right, you can go month to month. That, that business, you can't, you can't plan, you can't bring an in inventory. You can't plan your staffing needs um, when you are on a month to month lease. So I think the Small Business Job Survival Act is crucial. Um, it is, it's really been a hot potato. It's been, it's generally gets assigned to, um, to an incoming council member who will probably not push it through um, because then what happens is once you've got that bill um, sitting there and not being acted on, then there's this policy that nothing else can come in that's like it. And so it really becomes sort of a wall. Um, so you can't, you can't really bring anything in else that's like it, but the council member that's responsible for it is not gonna push it. Um, whoever, uh, whoever is the council person from district two has to have a seat on the small business council, uh, the small business committee. Uh, small businesses are the lifeblood of this district. Uh, um, council member Rivera had a seat on the small business um, committee and she, 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 uh, she dropped off the committee. She, we had a seat and she gave it up. Thank you. Uh, Ali? Can you repeat the question? Sure. Uh, what would you do to help small businesses? Would you support the proposed special district in the East Village, which would limit chain stores? Would you support the Small Business Job Survival Act? What other measures would you support? And how would you, as city council member, work to get them enacted? Thank you. So I think like, especially where I live, 
I can think of, um, there's a storefront around the corner from me that a, an artist went to and said, I'll pay you $2,000 a month if I can rent your storefront and you can like basically go month to month. The landlord said, no. He said, I want $7,000. And because he said, he's, and he said, I'm actually, I make more if I'm keep it empty than rent it less than the rent I want. So that is a standard practice. And I think that needs to stop. So for that reason, I support the Small Business Job Survival Act. And in fact, I would take, I am, I would take, I would sponsor it or co-sponsor it. I also think we need to eliminate the commercial rent tax for small businesses um, who make less, who spend and rent um, less than $500,000. And I also think, I think what would make a huge difference is if we eliminate the tax deductions for income loss for landlords who are, who are keeping their storefront, their storefronts empty. And I think that would improve the quality of life of our neighborhood as well in our district. And then there is one thing that is really important to me is that I would like to reintroduce Ben Kalis's 2016 bill that requires um, more finite restrictions on how long you can keep sidewalk um, scaffolding up. Because in our district, there is scaffolding that has been up for 10 plus years. Thanks very much. All right, we're gonna um, switch topics here. Uh, and again, I'll start, we'll be starting with Ali and then go to Erin. What would you do about or support regarding the need to address affordable affordability issues in our neighborhoods and in our city? Do you support the approach of large upzonings allowing much larger development with a percentage give back supposedly reserved for affordable housing, which the de Blasio administration has pushed? If not, what other approaches would you or do you support to address this important issue? So, Ali. Okay, so I think de the de Blasio administration's approach to affordable housing, I think we all can agree on, has not worked. He is, we have created uh, uh, over oversupply of luxury housing um, not just in district two, but overall in all five boroughs. And so the idea of like, oh, we'll create a supply, like we'll increase the supply and that will lower the price of apartments has not worked out. Instead, what has happened is that they've based the income mean um, on like lower, like on Manhattan, not just on Manhattan, or it's not on individual apart, um, neighborhoods. It's being like high, it incorporates a wider, like a larger scale of people. So I think to me, it's really important to increase affordable home ownership for lower middle class and low income people in our neighborhood because I'm recognizing our buildings are being owned by corporations. Like the liability to own a building as a person is just, isn't something that anyone wants to take on. And so like, to me, that's problematic that we, because we're now, we're at, we're dependent upon corporations. And I don't think that's right. So to me, creating more like co-op opportunities, the affordable home ownership opportunities, but base it on the, the entrance to get into these opportunities be based on the, the income mean of the neighborhood. And I think that's where we will be able to create more affordable, like genuine affordable housing. And I also want to put in quickly, I would like to support small, small room occupancy too. That's very important to me. Okay, thank you. Um, Aaron, same question. And unmute yourself. Hi. Um, so, 
So the, fir the first thing I would do is I, I think we need to take a, a breather from this um, affordability crisis because I think right now, I think that there are so many moving parts in the city that we don't, we don't in fact know what the lay of the land is gonna be. Um, you know, we've seen some like dramatic um, indic indicators um, such as the, um, uh, you know, a huge decline in number of kindergartners uh, that are applying for kindergarten spots, um, middle schools, middle schools applying middle school um, that seem to indicate that that some families have left the, the city and are not coming back. Um, so I really do think that we need to, we, we need to get to the other side or closer to the other side of COVID. We need to figure out where we really are. And then I think that we need to, we need to take a serious look at these commercial buildings um, that may never be uh, fully utilized as offices ever again. Um, I think that um, there are some commercial buildings that could be completely converted into residential. There are some that could be some very nice mixed use. Um, you know, there are a lot of countries in Asia where you see a lot of mixed use um, uh, uh, buildings. Um, and I think that would be completely appropriate, particularly in uh, neighborhoods of District 2, which are already very mixed use. Um, I definitely think uh, single room single room occupancies. I think we need to go back to that. Um, I I think that we need to um, to make it easier to create basement apartments. Um, there may be a lot of brownstones, um, smaller buildings um, along our streets that that uh, could could offer up a nice basement apartment. And I also think we need to make it easier to change certificate of occupancies um, so that some of our storefront retail space. Um, that will never be retail space um, again can be you know slowly converted into into housing for people that are interested in living um, that close to the streetscape. Great, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, what is your position regarding outdoor dining and the move to make it permanent in all locations? And Aaron, we'll start with you. Um, I I agreed with um, with the outdoor dining um, when it started. Um, there's no question that our local restaurants are struggling. There's no question that um, a lot of the people that worked in those restaurants, um, you know, because when, when they started to lay people off and switch to more of a, of a delivery model, um, a lot of the lower, uh, the lower income staff members were the, were the first ones to get laid off. Um, there's no question it was the right thing to do. Um, it revitalized our street, our streetscapes. You know, the East Village went from feeling like zombie apocalypse to you know something that was lived in and vibrant again. And you know, if I speaking just for myself, it gave me and my family a lot of hope that better days were around the corner. Um, however, I I think that it should be permanent, um, and I think that we need to go back to um, to the way things were before. I think that the regulation of sidewalk cafes should go back to consumer affairs. Um, I don't think that the Department of Transportation has any business regulating um, you know, things that have to do with noise control, um, that, that have to do with um, you know, whether fire trucks can get down the street, um, you know, whether, whether there is um, you know, an overflow of garbage that, that, that comes from a lot of these uh, restaurant sheds. Um, so I think it's time to start to dial them back, particularly, um, I think in a few weeks, we're going to be um, right back to pre-COVID um, uh, closing times and pre-COVID occupancy of restaurants. So I think it's time to start to, to walk back from that and, um, and, and free up our streets, um, you know, for other things. I mean, I, I, I don't mind thinking, you know, trying to put little small parks along them or, you know, create little... Um, you know, little seating areas um, in other ways, but just the big sheds and the noise that they bring and the garbage that they bring is just not appropriate for, for our neighborhoods. Thank you, thank you. Ali? So I, I do agree with Aaron that I did agree with the open restaurants program when it was initially started and um, my family even, like we didn't go to restaurants until they started that program. So I definitely agree that it was a worthwhile program to start at the time, but I also, I think it's also important to remember that it was tough running a restaurant before COVID. So it's gonna, it will be tough running a restaurant post pandemic. And with that being said, I think we do need to go back 
to how approving outdoor seating was done before the pandemic, which was through the community board. And I think it's, I think that was based like the community boards always, community board three, community board five, com community board six, community board two. They, they do really put a lot, I've witnessed the community board hearings that they, they really do put a lot of genuine effort into figure, like figuring out whether or not to approve a application. And I think we need to go back to that because, you know, we're all like noise, while I was petitioning and gathering signatures, numerous people complained about that open restaurants to me for different reasons. And it makes me aware, like, you know, the majority of people's apartments face a street. And so if we open our windows, especially in the summer, like the spring and summer and the fall, you're going to hear the noise, the noises outside. In some cases, you're going to hear the noises even if your windows are closed. So we need to recognize we need to live together as it's not um, about just one community. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So we're we're going to hit our uh, final moderator questions here, and they're going to go a little bit outside of just the sort of standard preservation uh, issues. So the first one is, uh, what do you think of the job Mayor de Blasio has done, especially as it relates to District 2? Which of his policies do you agree or disagree with? Um, and I will start with Allie. Uh, um, I can't really think of anything I agree with what he's done, <laughs> but I think the number one issue um, that I disagree with what he's done that has adversely impacted my family is the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, which, event which basically means let's bury East River Park for four to five years if we're lucky. Um, I, I do live in, a, in the flood zone and my first four neighbors lost everything because the flood waters came up to the doorknobs. So I know we need flood protection. And so I take this very, this my stance very personally because I know it affects people I know directly. And I think we, in addition, um, we, uh, other issues that I've disagreed with him on is on education. Um, I have two daughters in elementary school and they were, they were in public school. But due to his education policies, we had to switch them to private school because they were no longer being challenged. And I don't think that's right because it doesn't matter what your skin color is. Children want to, especially young children, want to learn. And so, um, so I think it's important to enable children to learn beyond grade level. Um, I would also I'm trying to think of something. Well, of course, I would also say the Governor's Island rezoning plan and all of the at-risk um, park spaces. It's crazy to me that in 2021, Aaron and I are running on a platform. We're both running on platforms to save parks. Who would have? Who would have thought that? Thank you, uh, Aaron. Uh, same question, and be sure to unmute yourself. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I just, I think that there has been such a lack of leadership over the past eight years. Um, and I, I mean, I just, one in our backyard, um, I, the, the former PS64 building, um, that is a building that has sat vacant now for decades. Um, and it's basically becoming nothing. It's becoming a danger to the neighborhood. Um, it's an eyesore. The sidewalk sheds have been up there for a long time, um, for years and years. Um, and and that is something that, you know, four years ago, he did a campaign stop in the Lower East Side and he said, um, or the East Village, and he said, you know, I think we're gonna, we're gonna use um, eminent domain to get the building back. And now here we are four years later and the building is still falling apart. Um, it's, uh, there's, um, there are repairs that desperately need to get made to it to, uh, to preserve the historic quality of the building. Um, so, but it's also just, it's just a massive um, loss of an opportunity. It's a massive 
um, gorgeous building that could be so many things for the community. Um, and and as I as I as I campaign in Tompkins Square Park, everyone has an idea of something that that building can be. Um, but the one person that doesn't seem to have an idea of what that building can be is Mayor Blasio, and he's the one person um, that could actually um, make it be something other than just you know a fire trap and a place for pigeons to live. Um, and I think uh, there's just been a lack of leadership in 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 other ways too. Um, you know, I think when you look at um, you know he he really wants to now be um, you know the, like sort of uh, you know the 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 czar of climate and resiliency. Um, and so his idea is let's you know let's take half of a beautiful green space and put some buildings on it. Um, instead of saying, you know, well, maybe there's some commercial spaces, maybe we should invest in CUNY. Uh, maybe there are other ways that we, that we can actually, um, you know, show some leadership and, and, and be innovative to actually um, solve the problems that the city's facing. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, and Richard, the last question. Um, in the upcoming election, who are you supporting uh, or, or voting for for mayor, uh, for comptroller, uh, for borough president? Are you supporting any other candidates for office in New York City? And if so, who and why? So I'll start with uh, Aaron, please. This, this, is, this is a question that I get so, so often when I'm out canvassing. Um, people, people are confused and frankly, I'm confused too. And, I, and I'm not sure that I'm gonna give a satisfactory answer to this question because I'm struggling with this myself. Um, you know, there are candidates that are good on one issue and terrible on another issue. And, um, you know, I, I would really, rather than rank choice voting, I'd like to be able to like rank aspects of them and say, you know, I would like to have this one's education policy and I would like to have this one's preservation policy. And I would like to have this one on the park. Although to be honest with you, I'm not sure apart from Art Chang, um, no, no one's been great on the, on the East, uh, East River Park issue. Um, so I apologize. It's a really, really hard question to answer. And um, there, there are there are some people that that um, that I think could be good. Um, I know Ben Kalos um, got an A rating from Human Scale, um, the Tribeca Trust, uh, which is uh, which is a group that I um, that I I trust. Um, and uh, you know, Lindsay Boylan has been out with us on the park issue um, and the, the issue of green spaces. Um, you know, both both of those are people that I feel like I could comfortably rank for bor borough president, um, for comptroller. Um, I, I you know I, I like um, I, I don't know. I, I'm really I'm really not going to be able to give you a satisfactory answer on this. I, I apologize. I, I wish, I really wish I could. I mean, I, it seems crazy to me that we can't look and say, here's someone that's completely aligned with all the things I believe. But I think what happens is that people are so twisted in, you know, in, in trying to, you know, create affordable housing by giving a land grab to developers. And people just, right. just uh, leadership is not able to think straight right now, I think in this city. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. So, uh, so I, I actually I'm sort of in a similar situation to Aaron uh, in the sense that I don't have a, an exact answer. I can tell you things. I I can tell you some things, but I don't. I'm since I'm an independent, I can't even vote in the primary this month. So, um, my husband is a Democrat, so he he's been paying more attention than I have. But I can tell you from being active in land use issues. Um, for the comptroller, I would definitely discourage people from voting for Corey Johnson and Brad Lander. I mean, Corey Johnson's um, comprehensive planning bill speaks for itself. Um, for Brad Lander, it's hard. He actually was one of the three city council members to vote no on the Governor's Island zoning plan. But he is pushing the rezoning of the Guanas area, Guanas neighborhood, which is not, which is like he's wanting to put a school in a brown, like in a brownfield. That's not right. Um, 
for Manhattan Borough President. Um, both Ben Kalos and Mark Levin both voted for the Governor's Island rezoning plan. So I'm not, I want to hold council members accountable for their vote. So to me, please, like if you value green space, um, please keep that in mind. I will say Lindsay Boylan and Kim Watkins have both publicly testified at public hearings in, in opposition of the Governor's Island rezoning plan and to save East River Park, which I very much appreciate. Thank you. Thanks very much. So that, that ends the uh, moderator question section. We're going to now move over to the Q&A from the public. If you haven't already, drop your questions in the chat. Uh, I've been looking at them. I see a couple that have come up. And I'm, the first one that I'm going to ask, and each of you will have up to two minutes to respond. You can also pass. So just uh, raise your hand if you do want to respond. But one of the questions I see in here is about the um, practice of member deference at the city council, whereby typically the council uh, as a whole will defer to the local council member in their vote on local issues. And I guess the question is whether or not that's a policy you would or a practice that you would uphold or not. And I'm going to um, inject a little sort of context from my own perspective here. Um, you know, it's an often derided practice because sometimes it can be very frustrating that you want to get other council members to vote for or against something, but they say, well, I'm just, I'm deferring to my local colleague. Um, on the other hand, if your representative wants to get the entire council to vote with them on a local matter of import, if you don't do the same in return, there's a very good chance that your fellow council members will vote against you on an issue in your district. So um, I guess the question is, how do you think you would handle um, that delicate dance? And I open it to either of you, just raise your hand to let us know that you want to respond. Erin? Um, yeah, so, so I think, um... You're welcome, Emily. Um, I think um, I, I want the rest of the council to give me council member deference because I, um, I truly have the best interest of this district at heart. Um, I think I have, I, you know, I know this district very well. Um, I've lived here for decades. Um, I've only gotten to know it better in the past several months while I've been walking the streets and campaigning. Um, and I am the type of person who is very thoughtful. I'm going to, to um, you know, figure out, uh, you know, exactly what's at stake, um, talk to the neighborhoods that are impacted and, and really figure out what the right thing is to do for the community that's gonna be impacted, um, which might not be uh, obvious to somebody who's not um, in the council district, but, you know, and it also, um, you know, the other thing is that there are there are a few things, there there aren't many things that happen in this council district that aren't also that also um, are not affecting uh, council district four or three or one. Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunities where um, you know where those council members can create blocks um, and and support each other. Um, however. Um, I'm not sure that I would want to be held to council member deference if I saw, um, for example, something like, uh, you know, where Margaret Chin was supporting uh, the upzoning of Governor's Island. Um, you know, that is something, yes, it's in council district one, but that's something that is visited by, I think, literally every zip code, people from every zip code in the entire city. So that's a place where, where I think, um, council member deference really made no sense because uh, although sure it's geographically located there it's actually an issue that affects the entire city and i think the entire city council uh should have should have looked at it clear-eyed um you know with their own mind thank you Allie. did you want to respond to that one as well yes i yes i very much will um so there has in my opinion there is there is a break like in theory Def, um, member deference works. But in practice, we've seen repeatedly, as Aaron mentioned, with the Governor's Island rezoning plan, there's a breakdown. And even with East River Park, there was a breakdown. I can tell you, at both of the City Council public hearings, 
for Governor's Island rezoning plan and for East River Park, almost 100 people spoke at each of those city council he public hearings. And in both instances, the city council member voted yes for those plans. So there is a real breakdown, but we can't, like I can, like, so we as constituents are dependent on, upon a benevolent city council member. But we also have to be aware, like, there is going to be a percentage of city council members who are beholden to developers and to Rebney. There's going, I'm optimistic that in this election year that there's going to be a higher number of city council members who, who want to answer to their constituents. But I also will say like, we really, before we can change, like remove member deference, we actually have to examine the ULIP process, which I know like takes the city charter to revive, to review, to revise. And to me, I think what would make things improve is if we gave the community board's veto power, because they're supposedly representing the community. And I would also like to add add a land use director we gotta to cut, each gotta, community. We got to cut you off there, Allie, but you, you may have a chance to add to that in either your closing statement or other questions. Uh, Richard, did you uh, have any public questions you wanted to chime in with? Because if not, I have one or two others as well. Sure. Um, there's a question about uh, saving uh, grocery stores in District 2. And uh, Food Emporium, I think, is actually officially closed as of yesterday. So, uh, you know, as anchors uh, to the community and, and, and very important um, stores for, you know, for people to get their everyday goods, uh, do uh, you have a plan to, to encourage uh, stores, new stores, to, new grocery stores to open up and to encourage grocery stores that are already open uh, to remain open? Uh, does someone want to raise a hand to answer that uh, first? Um, Aaron, I'll, I'll go. Um, so, so in the case of so the food emporium, um, that's a situation where the best bet would have been for um, for the council member to insert herself into the process. Um, the, the 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 best the best thing a council member could have done there is to, to help mediate, to help negotiate. Um, it, something similar happened further along 14th Street. Um, it was actually in Council District 4 a few years ago um, where there was a grocery store that was slated to close and the then council member got involved um, and, and tried to mediate between the landlord and the, the grocery store owners. Um, but in a situation like that, it is actually, it's a private, um, you know, it's a private landlord, um, you know, one, one thing that you could have done is it is in a very large building. Um, you could have uh, tried to activate the tenants in that building um, to, you know, to really um, contact, reach out to the landlord, let the landlord know that, that they weren't happy with that decision. Um, in terms of incentivizing additional grocery stores, um, you know, you you need to look around and see where there is large space uh, for a grocery store that has not now become a target. Um, and then, you know, it's just it's it's another negotiation, negotiating with a private landlord, um, negotiating with a private grocery store company, um, you know, to try to make a connection uh, between them and um, to bring in uh, community use. Um, but you know, in this case, Food Emporium is sort of a big box, big box store already. Um, it's being replaced by another big box, big box store. But yes, I mean, I, I, I fully appreciate that that we're losing um, groceries and fresh produce um, from that space. Thank you. Uh, Ali, would you like to answer? Yes. So I do agree with Aaron that the city council member can intervene on behalf of the community with um, to and the grocery store to talk to the landlord. I think that that's a reasonable reasonable ask. And and I noticed like in the Lower East Side area of our district, 
there were only two grocery stores. So I, so I will say like there are areas of our district that actually desperately need more grocery stores. Um, and that it is a hard ask because you are looking at storefronts that fit the square footage, what would be the square footage for a grocery store. But I also am aware of storefronts that have been like, like in the Steiner building, Steiner East on between 11th and 12th on Avenue A. That's been empty for year for years. And but that could hold a grocery store. And but I so I think perhaps an alternative would be to work with the green market and set up like a farmer's market in the areas that are losing grocery stores or do not or like in the in lower east side near um set up farmers markets so people can get fresh produce and to me that would be an even better win because you're you're engaging with farmers who are small business owners great thank you um looks like we have time for one more uh, question from the public and one that i've received several kind of in the vein of <clears throat> is to ask the candidates we all complain a lot about the city's ULERP process or the way in which land use decisions or zoning changes take place. Um, but how would you actually change or restructure that process to make it better, fairer, or have better outcomes? Either of you want to take a crack? Allie? Yes. So I've given this a lot of thought <laughs> since I, um, because of the Governor's Island rezoning plan. In, in the case of Governor's Island rezoning plan, community board one voted no with conditions. Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, but, um, recommended no with conditions. The city planning commission actually did not have a unanimous vote. Um, and then we get to city council and they, it's 44 to three with one abstention. So there was obviously vocal in every step of the way, there was vocal public dissent. So to me, I would like to, I mean, you look to change ULERP, it takes a city charter. So you definitely, it, it's a team effort. So to me, I would, as I said earlier, I would like to give the community board veto power to send the developer back to revise their plan to better fit the community's needs and, and also provide funding for a land use structure. Because I do know Diana Switzel, um, Switzel, I can't pronounce her last name, but I can spell it. Um, she's, she was amazing working on Governor's Island. And so I think other community boards, do, I'm aware, do not have full-time land use directors. And also one thing I have, I'm, I've become aware of recently is that there are certain city council districts that have not had any new development in the past eight years. And that's because of the city council member solely. So I think that's something to be aware of. Erin? Um, yeah, it, yes, it, it requires a charter revision, but um, I think that the secret tech, technical manual needs a revision to, uh, to make sure that there are racial impact studies um, done along with all the other environmental studies that are required by CEQA. Um, I think Jumani Williams is trying to do it through a local law through an intro, but um, which, which may be successful, but I think at the end of the day, it really should be a charter revision. Um, and I also think that, um, you know, these, these ULERPs generally come to us fully baked, um, you know, by the time the community gets to see them, you know, the, the developer and the engineer and the, um, and the architect and the landlord, you know, everyone, everyone is so, is so invested in what they see as the design and what's going to happen on that, on that piece of land. Um, it's just too late. It's just too late. The, the, 
the clock should not start ticking when the community gets the plan. The community should get the plan well in advance. Um, and I know people say, well, that's just gonna lead to more nimbyism. That's just gonna lead to more um, you know, intractable neighborhoods. I, I don't think that that's the case. I mean, giving, giving a community a voice um, earlier on, I think actually could do the opposite. I think that it could, it could avoid those situations where we get to the end where everyone's just angry at each other. Um, you know, people can be reasonable and, and if it's the right land use for the community and, you know, the community, you know, gets on board and, and um, you actually start talking about it before, the, before everything is completely set in stone um, and you're not just turning it over to the community as, you know, this is, our, this is a done deal. This is a done deal, you know, now you get your, you know, handful of months to, you know, to get really upset about it. Um, so those are the two things. I think, I think we need to, I think it needs to be completely obvious um, what the racial and economic displacement impact is of anything that is, uh, that is seeking ULERP. Um, and um, I think that the community needs to get a hold of, of it um, at a time when their input could actually be meaningful. Great, um, thank you both. Uh, Richard, I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce closing statements. Yes, uh, we have time for uh, each of you to do a closing statement, uh, two minutes, please. And uh, we'll start off with uh, Ali, thank you. Okay, um, so I'm Ali Ryan, and I wanna thank everybody for hosting this very important um, preservation and planning candidate forum for us to talk about matters that affect all of us. I think of land use as an umbrella term for, for different issues, for multiple issues that affect how we are able to survive and thrive in, in District 2 as well as in New York City. And for me, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think that it, I, I do believe that we need to put a moratorium on, um, on the ULIP process and we need to evaluate what housing, sorry, we need to evaluate all these developments that have been going, have, that have sprung up and we need to habit, people's habits have changed. They're not, like people are working from home. People are buying on the internet. So I think it's, this is a time, a time that we have an opportunity to retrofit existing buildings. Resiliency is very much real and climate change is real. So we do need to evaluate the coastline of all five boroughs, not just our district. And, and I do, so I do think it's important to take all of those issues into consideration as we go forward and what we do with, and um, how we proceed with our growing our district in a way that is best for, for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Erin. Um, um, so I just want to say uh, thank you to Richard and thank you for Andrew. Thank you, thank you to Andrew for moderating. Um, this is um, really, really entertaining. Uh, not entertaining, but very informative and 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 a, a great great way to spend the evening. Um, I want to say that. Uh, so um, so I'm Aaron Hussein and I am running to uh, to replace uh, Councilmember Rivera in City Council. Um, and um, I also want to thank Ellie for stepping up uh, to, to run against uh, whichever of us wins in, in um, November. But I just want to make clear that I do think that, that I have got to beat her in June because I think that we need to send a message uh, now. We can't wait until November. We can't wait until January 1st to send her um, a message that she's out of step with the community. She's not listening to the community. She's not representing um, you know, what we have very loudly and very publicly asked for. Uh, we're asking for real affordable housing. We are asking for protection of our green space. We are asking for, um, 
you know, we're not asking to win every fight, but we're certainly asking to be, uh, to have a seat at the table. We are asking to preserve our sky and our streetscapes. Um, and we're asking to, to live in a livable human scale community um, where, where we can sit and be civil and have conversations. And when it's not about winners and losers, um, the way a city communicates its properties is how it uses its money and how it uses its land. And that's why I think that this is an incredibly important subject for, for, uh, for the city council people to be addressing. Um, I'm very sorry that uh, Councilmember Rivera couldn't make it tonight because it certainly would have been very interesting to hear her point of view on how the city should be using the land in District 2. Um, I think that we all agree we should be using the land for parks. We should be using the land to house New Yorkers. Um, we should be using the land to build community facilities, to build schools, um, to build methadone clinics where they are necessary. Um, Aaron, Aaron, we have to stop you there, but, uh, but, but thank you very much. Um, and so in closing, I just want to say thank you to all of the co-sponsors, of course, to the candidates. And I do want to make note, we made every effort possible to accommodate Council Member Rivera's schedule, but nothing Nothing that we did seem to work, um, but we're very grateful for the candidates who were here, um, for all of our co-sponsors tonight. And I wanna remind everyone that tonight's forum was recorded and will be available for viewing and sharing on the Village Preservation website and our YouTube page in about a day or so. So take a look for it. If you're on our email list, you'll get it sent to you. We'll also be sharing candidates' responses to our questionnaires on our website and in our email list so just go to villagepreservation.org and those will all be available by Thursday or Friday at the latest. And Ariel, I'll just ask you to drop villagepreservation.org in the chat again before we close out. Already um, done. Excellent. And remember, uh, primary day is Tuesday, June 22nd. Um, we may well be having another one of these before November, um, but uh, you know we don't tell you who to vote for, but we try to give you good information and remind you that it is your civic duty and privilege to vote. So please take advantage of it on June 22nd. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a good night. Yes, thank you, everyone.